Well, good morning. morning. Wow. What a blessing to see so many young people out at this hour in the morning. Isn't this great? Praise the Lord. Almost totally full. Unbelievable. It's good to see all of you. Did you sleep well last night? Yeah, a little warm? (laughs) That's okay, though. Not a problem. As long as we have this Christian fellowship and warmth, uh, you know, we can put up with a few inconveniences here and there, can't we? Because compared to what's coming, these inconveniences are nothing. Before we enter our study this uh, morning, we want to ask for the Lord's presence and his blessing. So I invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the privilege of being in this beautiful place in the mountains. We thank you, Father, for the fresh air. We thank you for the sunshine. We thank you for Christian fellowship. But above all, we thank you for your holy word. Father, how terrible it would be to be in this world without any guidance, direct guidance from you. But we thank you that you have given us a compass in your word. And as we open that word this morning, we ask for the presence of your spirit. For we are fully aware that the Holy Spirit gave the Bible. And without the aid of the Holy Spirit, we could never understand what he gave. So be with us and instruct us and guide us. We thank you, Father, for hearing and answering our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. There are two things that go together like a hand and a glove. And that is the Hebrew sanctuary and the book of Revelation. The reason why the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and I don't say this arrogantly, but I do say it truthfully, the reason why the Seventh-day Adventist Church is the only church in the world that understands the book of Revelation is because it's the only church in the world that understands the Hebrew sanctuary. You see, the book of Revelation follows the exact sequence of the Hebrew sanctuary from beginning to end. And in our devotional period this morning, I would like to uh, go into the book of Revelation and follow the sequence of the book of Revelation and share with you how Revelation follows the exact sequence of ministration and of places of the Hebrew sanctuary. Now, I would like to review just a little bit the geography of the Hebrew sanctuary for those uh, who are not real well-versed in the Hebrew sanctuary, I'd like to just give a description and also a description of the daily and the yearly service. So most of this will be review for a lot of you, but I feel that it's important to do this. Uh, The Hebrew sanctuary had four key places. We usually think of three, but it had four. The first was the Hebrew encampment where the Israelites lived. You see, they were part of the sanctuary. They will build me a sanctuary and I will dwell among them. Without them, the sanctuary would be useless because really they were the ones who needed the services of the sanctuary. So the first place, uh, key place of the sanctuary was the encampment. The second key place of the sanctuary was the court. And the central piece of furniture in the court, of course, was the altar of sacrifices. The uh, sacrifice, the animals were sacrificed and they were placed upon the altar. And then, of course, you went into the tent proper And uh, the first apartment was called the holy place. And in the holy place, as you went in from the eastern side, you would look to your left, that is to the south, and you would see the seven-branch candlestick, which uh, was burning, the the lights were burning all day, 24-7, all day and all night. Then as you look to your right, you saw the table of the showbread. There were uh, 12... um, breads, or I wouldn't say loaves, but you had 12 cakes of bread, and uh, they were distributed into two piles, six and six, and I believe that's a special purpose for that. And then as you look straight forward, still in the holy place, you saw the altar of incense, where morning and evening, continually, the incense, the smoke of the incense was ascending and going over the curtain into the most holy place. Then, of course, the fourth key place of the sanctuary was the most holy place. And in the most holy place, you had the Ark of the Covenant. 
And inside the Ark of the Covenant were uh, actually three things. You had Aaron's rod that budded, and you had the pot of manna. But in a central location, and what I especially want to dwell upon, were the Ten Commandments. The law of God were contained there. And of course, above the Ark was what was known as the mercy seat, and that's where the glory of God, the Shekinah, came down uh, to dwell in the Hebrew sanctuary. Now, also, the sanctuary, besides the geography of it, had uh, a daily and a yearly service. The daily service had to do with the court and with the holy place of the sanctuary. You see, uh, the sacrifices were offered morning and evening, besides other, uh, other sacrifices. But there was a morning and evening sacrifice, which means that upon the altar, the sacrifice was burning continually. Uh, in the holy place... The bread was to be there continually. Uh, the incense was to be going up continually. The seven uh, lamps of the candlestick were supposed to be lighted continually. In other words, what took place in the court and in the holy place was a continual thing. It was daily. It was the daily service of the sanctuary. Uh, the services of the most holy place were yearly. Uh, in other words, once a year, at the end of the year, you had the Day of Atonement and the, day, and the Feast of trumpet, trump, Trumpets that announced the Day of Atonement. And, of course, the Day of Atonement was the great day of judgment when Israel was judged and they needed to afflict their souls uh, during the time that the a high priest was in the most holy place of the sanctuary. And so, at the end of the year, once a year, you have the services of the most holy place of the sanctuary. Now, what I want to share this morning is the fact that the book of Revelation follows the exact order of the Hebrew sanctuary and reveals to us the di different steps that Jesus takes as he uh, does his utmost to save us. Now, if you ask uh, most Christians why Jesus came to this earth, they'll say, well, he came to save me or he came to die on the cross. And that's true. Jesus came to save us and Jesus came to die on the cross. But the Hebrew sanctuary is much, in, much more involved than just the sacrifice in the court. You have the services of the holy place and you have the service of the most holy place of the sanctuary representing different aspects of the work of Christ. Now, as we begin, I would just like to say that the different parts of the Hebrew sanctuary depict different functions of Jesus Christ in the plan of salvation. His work in the court represents primarily Jesus as sacrifice. His work in the holy place represents Jesus primarily as intercessor. His work in the most holy place represents primarily his work as judge. And there's one further function. Once the Hebrew sanctuary closes, the function of Jesus that is depicted is Jesus as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So the Hebrew sanctuary depicts four functions of Jesus. Jesus as sacrifice, Jesus as intercessor, Jesus as judge, and Jesus as King. And I believe that the book of Revelation reveals all of these functions in the exact order of the Hebrew sanctuary. Now, I'm only going to share with you this morning the high points of the book of Revelation. I wish we had time to study the nitty-gritty, the, the, the little details in between each one of these high points, but obviously we don't have the time, and I trust that uh, many of you are taking notes or you're going to get the CD or the DVD, uh, if there is one, and uh, that you're going to take it home and you're going to say, okay, I'm going to check this out, I'm going to check Pastor Bohr out. And you study everything in between the high points that we're going to take a look at in our study this morning.